a local indicator of spatial autocorrelation or LISA statistic is something that allows you to assess autocorrelation location specific. For each location, you can carry out a test in the following sense. Is the value that I observe at this location, is that value more similar to its neighbors, its immediate neighbors, than would be the case randomly? And you can do this location by location. Or that would be positive spatial autocorrelation. Or the opposite. Is this value more dissimilar from the neighboring observations than would be the case randomly? And that is then negative spatial autocorrelation. So this is something that allows you then to locate the clusters. Rather than pertaining to the pattern as a whole, you can locate the clusters in a particular location. And as we'll see in a few minutes, you will also be able to characterize the clusters in the sense of what type of cluster is this. Is this clusters of high values or clusters of low values? Or the opposite, spatial outliers, where a high is surrounded by a low or the other way around. There's another aspect to these local statistics, namely that they're connected to a global statistic. And that is a little more of a technical thing um, we didn't really have time to elaborate on this today. We'll get back to this tomorrow. But e all this stuff, all this analysis of cross-sections is based on some fairly strict assumptions, basically notions of equilibrium. Uh, if you don't have an equilibrium across space in some sense, then we're out of business. You know, if, if everything changes all the time, then with our single snapshot, we have no chance of understanding what is going on. So we have to impose this structure, these kinds of assumptions. One of them is that the same process is holding everywhere. And that's not necessarily true. I mean, that's an assumption. It's, it's a working assumption. One way to assess this is to see the extent to which this global statistic is composed of its individual elements. And as we'll see in a minute, most global statistics, they have this double summation over i and over j. So if you take the first one out, then for each i, you can compute a statistic. And that is, in fact, a local statistic. And if you sum them together, sometimes with a little transformation, they give you the global statistic. So the global Moran's i turns out to be the average of the local Moran's i statistics. So then you can look at this more from a diagnostic point of view and try to identify are there particular locations that are really driving my global statistic? Or is this basically kind of spread out and everybody contributes more or less equally? And this is important because if the whole thing is driven by one or two locations, then we don't have our spatial stationarity, our equilibrium assumption, which we need. And that's a very important thing to, to look at as a diagnostic. And there's several examples, and in the lab you might run into some of them, where, and with Geoda, everything is interactive. So you can take observations out or include different subsets of observations. So you can see how the autocorrelation changes as you move over subsets of the data. And under stationarity, it shouldn't, because the same process should be working everywhere in the data. But if you don't have stationarity, then it could very well be that your overall measure of clustering, your global measure of spatial autocorrelation, is completely driven by a small subset of the, uh, the data. There's one data set on um, homicides around St. Louis, which has county data, where if you remove St. Louis and its immediate St. Louis County and St. Louis City from the data set, the measure of spatial autocorrelation falls flat and essentially disappears. So the global measure is completely, or not completely, but to a large extent, driven by the high correlation, the extremely high correlation between St. Louis as a city and the surrounding county. And, and that's not something you want, because what you want in stationarity is that, you know, it really shouldn't be just one or two observations that drive your measure of autocorrelation. I'm confused. This one's always confused me. Uh, locational invariance or stationarity. So my understanding of this assumption is 
everywhere you go, strong stationary is the means are the same, weaker is the variance is the same, or vice versa, things like this. But if you look at the data, it's telling you about heterogeneity. Otherwise, we're not bothering to go through this analysis, and it's all the same. And indeed, we meet the assumption of stationarity or, or locational invariance, we don't bother with this. <coughs> Yet that, if I understand this correctly, that that's an assumption that underlies geostatistics, lattice analysis, I don't want to like how you know. Yet, <laughs> we're using that assumption here kind of like when we shouldn't be, or I'm, I'm, I'm confused. No, this is a very good point. The um, <coughs> Strict stationarity is that the distribution is the same everywhere. Now, the distribution is really the joint distribution. So that means that not just the mean, but also the second moments, which is the variance and the covariance, are, are stable in some sense. What does that mean? Typically, the mean is constant, the variance is constant, and the covariance only depends on relative positioning, not absolute positioning. So it would only depend, say, on the different distance or on the immediate neighbor structure, not on where you find those neighbors. Okay. This is where this stuff comes in. Because the covariance is the relation between, or a measure of the strength of association between the value at one location and the value at another location. In the leases, we, we approximate this by comparing a location to its neighbors, to the average of its neighbors. So in a strict sense, that covariance should be constant everywhere. Now, it's a sample, so there's always randomness. So we can't expect this number to be exactly the same. It will vary, but it will vary within some tolerance. Now, unless we have standard errors on that, we can't really draw firm conclusions. So this is why this is exploratory. But the, the bottom line is that there should be some constancy in this association, no matter where you are in the data set. You, you shouldn't have, for example, in an extreme case, that you know the northern half of your map shows no other correlation whatsoever, and the southern part shows, shows strong correlation. That is an instance of where stationarity is violated because you, would, you should have the same covariance spatial correlation no matter where you are. You can think of this as a moving window over the data. As you move your window over the data, the mean stays the same, the variance stays the same, and the covariance should stay the same. Okay? Now, because it is a random sample, you cannot really quantify what the same means by just looking at the numbers. You have to have, for example, for the mean as an estimate, you take the average, but the average has a standard error itself. So if you have an average here of five and an average there of seven, as such, you can't really say that these are different. You need to have a sense of the precision of your estimate. In the same way, you need to have a sense of the precision of your covariance estimate before you can really say whether they're the same or different. <coughs> if this is too distracting, well, let me, let me take the second question then. Uh, you have a, the global as kind of the mean, the average of the locals. And you have some variability among the locals, so you could compute a, a variability. It, it could, can that be used as a guide to get an indication of in, in principle, yes, but it would be very complicated to get the standard errors. And, I, you know, basically, let me step back a second. The way this is done, we're doing, this is a quick refresher of descriptive statistics, okay? The way we're doing it in the regression analysis, and this may be, maybe clarify some of these issues, is stationarity, as you suggest, is a very strict and very strong assumption. And basically, you know, you don't believe it, right? Okay. 
Now, in regression modeling, we have a model for the mean. So we have y is x beta plus an error term. So the mean of y is not constant, but it is conditional on the x's. It's explained by this linear part of the model. And then what's left is the error term, which has a mean of 0. So that, in fact, is station. I mean, is at least mean stationary. So then we move on. We look at the variance. And again, you may not accept that the variance is constant. So then we get we put some structure for the variability of the variance, if you wish. And then what's left is, again, variance stationary. And the same with the autocorrelation. If that is not constant, we can put in a model for the variability of the autocorrelation. And then what's left is stationary. So the stationarity is really conceptual in that you model everything that varies. And then whatever is left, should satisfy the stationarity requirement. That's really the way to think about it in, in actual modeling. And, and sure, I mean, it's very difficult to operationally say whether the mean is in fact constant when you look at a map. You know, what you can do is like t-test type of things and take subsets or do analysis of variance on subsets of the data to see if, if these assumptions hold, but that's just you know, it's actually fairly crude. What we're really interested in is after we specify the regression model, how are our error terms doing in terms of this stationarity assumption? <coughs> so the thing is to, um, anytime we have a global statistic that can be decomposed, we uh, have a local statistic. So any time as I mentioned, we have this double sum, just to uh, illustrate this here. We have the sum over i of the sum over j. So then if we just take this, then for every i, we have a local statistic. And we sum them up, and we have the global statistic back. You know, that's a very simple principle. And I only talk about Moran's i here, but there is another statistic called Geary c, which uses square differences, same thing. You know, because of the double summation and there's no interaction, you know, you just take out the first sum and for every location you have a new statistic. <coughs> so the local Moran, and, you know, I won't dwell on this too much. Uh, you, have, you can revisit this later if you're not familiar with this. But the local Moran is just somehow a standardized measure of the sum the average of the neighbors, the, the sum over j of wij and then um, it turns out as i mentioned that the global moran is nothing but the average of the local morans so there is a very nice way to tie the two together inference again same problem how do we do this it's very tricky it's even more tricky than for the, the global measure we um, can work analytically but basically forget it don't do it uh, I know some software does it that way, but it's really not a good thing. It's a very poor approximation. The normal distribution is not, uh, the, I mean, it's not a good approximation in, in most instances. The way to do it is computational. Keep it simple. So-called conditional permutation. Why conditional? Because we hold a value fixed in a location, permute what's around it, and recompute the statistics. So rather than doing this for the whole data set, 999 times, we have to do this for each location 999 times. So there's a lot of computing going on when you do this. It's actually a lot simpler than the way I put it to you because you only have to draw the immediate neighbor. So if you have five neighbors, you don't have to reshuffle all the observations. You just have to draw five from the pool that could be neighbors recompute the statistic and do this multiple times. And that gives you, again, for each location now, an empirical reference distribution that tells you how your observed statistic stacks up compared to the ones that you have randomly generated. Then what do you do with this? <clears throat> two things, two maps. One map is what I call a significance map <coughs> 
it's essentially a map of uh, colors and blanks and the blanks are the locations that do not have a significant local statistics and then the colored ones are the locations that do have a significant local statistic this is the only way to do it do not make a map of the local statistics themselves because the ones that are not significant are zero for all practical purposes so they shouldn't give you an indication of a sign that's highly misleading because they're spatially random so in terms of practical applications this is what a map like that looks like um, the darker the color the more significant and you see all the white spots in North Carolina counties in this case the white spots are um, non-significant local statistics then the more interesting map from a, a exploratory analysis point of view is the Le what I call the LISA cluster map and that again only shows the significant locations but now through a device that we didn't have time to talk about but you can explore in the lab I call the Moran scatter plot we can categorize the type of association into high high and low low which is two exam which are two examples of positive spatial autocorrelation and low high and high low which are examples of negative spatial autocorrelation and um, these then get a color code so that you end up with a map like this which is um, the red is the positive high high spatial autocorrelation the blue is the positive autocorrelation but for low low values and then the two other colors are what we call spatial outliers it's high surrounded by low and low surrounded by high and this then you can use to uh, focus in on uh, what the clusters are and what the outliers are and to start thinking about possible explanatory factors be behind this <clears throat> the um, difference between the two is that the spatial outliers are location specific and the clusters are clusters so the test is for each location it suggests a cluster but the cluster itself is more than that location it's that location and its neighbors so this is something to keep in mind if you look at this map this kind of highlights this shows you that the cluster is more than just a core but it also has the location surrounding it Yes. But you call them outliers. Yeah. Because they're different from the initial pattern? I call them outliers and uh, I call them spatial outliers because they are spatially different from their neighbors. So they are high surrounded by low. Now, it's significant. So in, in some sense, you can say it's, it's higher surrounded by low than it would be randomly. I mean, randomly you can expect to find some places where high is surrounded by low or low is surrounded by high now when the magnitudes are such that is highly unlikely to happen in a random data set then it's significant and then you reject a no and then you call it a spatial outlier or I call it a spatial outlier because it is different from its spatial neighbors this doesn't necessarily make it an outlier in the usual sense in that it would be in the tail of the distribution. Yeah. Uh, is spatial outlier the same thing as negative spatial autocorrelation? In this sense, yes. It's the same as leg negative local spatial autocorrelation. Okay. Uh, did Lisa, uh, or did Gina uh, produce this map, or did you, how did you get the cross pattern across that? Oh, we faked it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, actually, it was done in Geoda because what we did is do the selection in Geoda and just change the cross hatching to a dark cross hatching and just click on these things, and that gives it to you. But yeah, I mean, I wish we had that built in, but we don't, or not yet. Uh, the areas, the, the border counties where you don't have a lot of neighbors, you're going to tend to have a higher 
you you tend to have weird things happen at the borders yeah because uh i mean again i don't really have time to elaborate on this but it's something it's another one of those things besides the dependence and the scale and the maup border effects in time series you have a starting point effect you know if you model a time series you have to figure out what is time zero what do i do with time zero and then everything kind of goes from there in space we have lots of time zeros if you wish every unit at the border has these neighbors that we don't observe and so um in smaller data sets in particular this can be a real issue would, and, would you ever i guess i guess one one way would be to include the neighboring counties in other states but then you may have different state policy with, with, you know something different going on or you could go from i guess first order to second order well, what I mean, assuming you have those neighbors, you would always try to go as far as you can. But the, the way this is dealt with is, is coming inward. So by coming inward, you create a buffer at the outside where for locations, let's say we take this location here and, and this is a buffer, then we actually observe the ones that are outside and we can have proper measures of the neighbors for those. Okay, so that, that is uh, the way, one way to deal with it. And so what you can do, and in fact you can do this in Geoda, you can uh, create the buffers, eliminate those observations, and recompute Moran's eye and see if it changes. Okay. So one last uh, set of caveats, and then we'll take a little break. Um, don't make too much of this. It's exploratory. It is not explaining anything. It suggests interesting locations. It just suggests potential covariates, but it doesn't prove anything. And in fact, it's univariate. And we all know that focusing on one variable in isolation can be highly misleading. And we have to keep an eye out for multivariate associations and interactions and that's what we do the regression for but it is nevertheless a very useful and very efficient exploratory technique in that very quickly and and you'll see in the lab this is very easy to do very quickly you start seeing whether things kind of gel in particular locations and high points of certain variables co-locate with high values of other variables and and so on and so in that sense it's a very um very useful technique it's also very useful to detect outliers spatial and otherwise which could be simple coding mistakes or they could not be and and it's highly efficient in that sense because it combines the visual with with the statistical and um, the, the test statistic so in a nutshell these measures of global and local spatial autocorrelation are most useful in the sense that they dismiss spatial randomness and start suggesting the type of spatial structure that we're interested in modeling. So this is as far as we'll go in terms of this test. After the break, we'll talk about the spatial weights. And, and just very briefly, I'll give you some examples, but that's really something you can explore in the lab, and the workbook in particular has several examples of how you can construct these and what, what to look for and so on. 